Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 127, The Pugachev Rebellion, Part 1. The piece you just heard was composed by Alexander Borodin. It's known as a string quartet number no. 1 in A major, the Scherzo Prestinzimo, and it was done by the Czech National Symphony. Now, last time, we recounted the ill-fated Bulavan Rebellion, which marked the end of independence for the Don Cossacks. It was also the smallest of the four major rebellions. Today, though, we will tell the story of the largest rebellion in Russian history until the revolutions of 1905 and 1917. The three previous revolutions were based in the Don and Volga River regions, but this one was different as it began in the area near the Yaik River, known as the Yaik Host, which is now known as the Ural River. One similarity with the previous insurrections, though, is that it was led by a Don Cossack, this time Emelian Pugachev. There were many Don and Volga Cossacks in the region, a number of them having fled their lands after one of the earlier revolts, with some having arrived after Ivan the Terrible's conquest of the Volga region. Whatever their origins, they loved their Yaik River region, as their saying went that it was the, quote, the golden dawn with a silver lining. The main way of making a living and feeding their families was through fishing. The rivers were loaded with all kinds of fish, enough to live comfortably and never feel the pangs of hunger. They also herded cattle and had salt mines, which were eyed greedily by the encroaching Muscovites. Year after year, the old ways were being taken away as more and more industry and farming grew inside the Yaik host. The famous Russian historian Vasily Kluchevsky once said about Russians that when they are unhappy, the way is open for a pretender. With all of the hatred of the government at the time, which was led by Catherine the Great, there was a time for a pretender to the throne for sure. Catherine saw to it that the people would have one in the person of her murdered husband, Peter III. On the, thir on the surface, Peter seems like a really odd person to be the people's czar, as he was completely German in both culture and by birth. He idolized Frederick the Great and had an open disdain for the Russian Orthodox Church and wasn't that interested in the peasant. Yet, despite all that, the people actually loved his actions. He lowered the salt tax, got rid of the secret police, converted the church serf to a state peasant, banned factory owners from buying serfs for their labor force, and even allowed old believers to come back to Russia and settle in the Saratov province near the Irgiz River. The old believers were even allowed to practice their religion freely, the first time since the schism in 1666. As you can see, while the nobility that overthrew Peter III and gave the crown to Catherine would not have benefited from his reign, the peasants saw him as a savior. Peter did one other thing, and that was to free the gentry from compulsory state service. To the serf, living in wretched slavery, it was a sign that they were soon to be freed as well. That is, until those bastard boyars and German nobility killed the one true Batushka Tsar. During Catherine the Great's 34-year reign, there were to be close to 20 people who claimed to be the true Tsar, Peter III. The rumor circulating amongst the peasants was that Peter had freed them, but was silenced before the proclamation could be made public. He had heard of the scheme to assassinate him, and he fled before they could grab hold of him, and he was in the countryside, in disguise, waiting for the moment to seize control of the throne and throw out his wicked, evil German wife. The first such rumor was floated around 1762, 11 years before the Pugachev Rebellion got started. By the time it did start, there were fully 10 pretenders already out there, with the first coming out, in 1764. Now, many of these pretenders were homesteaders whose lives were being encroached upon by the Muscovite expansion. Others were soldiers or serfs that had run away. 
The most successful one before Pugachev was a runaway serf known as Fedot Bogomolov, working as a boatman on the Volga River, who presented himself as Peter and showed them the, quote, czar's signs, which were small scars that were in the shape of the cross. Bogomolov's small rebellion started in 1772 and gained steam through the familiar areas we talked about in the last three podcasts, like Tsaritsyn and the lower Volga Valley. He had the Cossack elders remembering how bad things got for them after the revolts were squashed. Well, they turned him in and had his nostrils slit, which was a common punishment in the day. Bogomolov was sentenced to life in Siberia, but he died on the way. There was another outbreak when a General Traubenberg came to Orenburg to try to arrest and execute a band of rebels, but his men were ambushed and murdered in January of 1772. The men, though, who did this were captured and sentenced to death. And that's something that we should remember in the future here. So it was late in 1772 that a man appeared on the Yaik claiming to be the true Peter III, one Emilian Ivanovich Pugachev. Of the four rebellion leaders, Pugachev was the only one to claim to be the Tsar. This is likely one of the main reasons why his was the largest of them all. When he appeared to the Yaik Cossacks, he was, as Professor Average puts it in his book, Russian Rebels, 1600 to 1800, quote, 30 years old, he was of medium height, broad-shouldered, and narrow-waisted, his face slightly pockmarked, with a short, dark beard already flecked with gray. A disgruntled Cossack with old believer sympathies, a deserter from military service, a fugitive from justice, a wanderer on the outskirts of society, he fit the pattern set by earlier pretenders of Catherine's reign. By an odd coincidence, he came from the same Don settlements, Zumoviskaya Stanitsa as Stenka Razin. When he was 17, Pugachev was enlisted into the army to fight the Seven Years' War against Prussia. He became an orderly to Colonel Ilya Denisov, but was treated horribly, once being whipped for allowing the colonel's horse to get away. Do remember his name, too, Ilya Denisov. So hatred of authority was deep-seated into Pugachev's psyche. When Peter III took control of the government, he ended the war and Pugachev was allowed to return home. Unfortunately for him, he was called back twice, once to round up fugitive old believers and once to fight a war against Turkey. Now an officer, Emilian became ill at the siege of Bender, was allowed to return home, but forced to return to the army despite not having recuperated. He escaped twice, but was captured and punished. His third attempt was successful as he made his way to Vetka, a Polish border town which harbored a large contingent of old believer refugees. It was at this time that Pugachev decided to pose as the returning Peter III. He snuck back into Russia, acting like an old believer who wanted to resettle in the Irgiz Valley. It was said that a runaway soldier and a merchant there remarked that Emilian looked like the late Tsar and should head to the Yaik and lead a rebellion against Catherine. In reality, Pugachev looked nothing like Peter, but who cared anyway? The people were unhappy and were looking for a pretender, whether he looked the part or not. And even though Peter would have been 14 years older, it didn't matter either. By 1772, Pugachev began to put his plan into play with the support of an old Moscow merchant turned abbot for an old believer monastery named Filaret. Arriving in the Yaik under the guise of a fish merchant, he made it there just after the sentences were handed down for the murder of Traubenberg and his men. Dozens were about to be executed and hundreds to be whipped with the knout, beards shaved and conscripted into the army. Pugachev announced to those who would listen that he was the true czar. Just then, he was betrayed and arrested, sent to a prison in Kazan. Luckily, he was aided in escaping by a guard who was sympathetic to the Old Believers movement, which Emelian claimed to be part of. Making his way once again back to the Yaik, Pugachev found a group of dissidents 
where he made his appearance as Peter III. He gave a speech to them that electrified the audience and started his campaign against Catherine and the Muscovite elite. Quote, I was in Kiev, in Poland, in Egypt, in Jerusalem, and on to the Terek River. From there I went to the Don, and then came to you. And I hear that you have been wronged, and that all the common folk have been wronged. There is great reason why I am not loved by the gentry. Many of them, young men and others of middling years, though fit to serve in given posts, went off to retirement and lived at their will off the peasants in their villages, and quiet ruined them, poor folk, and they alone almost ruled for themselves the whole empire. So I began to compel them to service, and wanted to take away from them their villages, so that they serve only for wages. And the officials who judge suits unjustly oppress the people I punished and wished to hand over to the block. And so for this they began to dig a ditch for me. And when I went to take a row on the Never River, they arrested me there, and they made a false tale about me and they forced me to wander over the face of the earth. Pugachev then proceeded to lay out his plan to depose Catherine with his son, Paul, whom rumor had it was not pleased with his mother. He said that when he got to St. Petersburg and confronted the Empress, he would send her to a nunnery, or better yet, back to her birth country. But, quote, if she meets me with bad words, I know already what to do then. Emelian played on the hatred of the Muscovite elite and foreigners. Quote, if God helps me to gain the throne, then Yaitsk would be the capital instead of Moscow or Petersburg, and the Yaik Cossacks will enjoy superiority over everyone else. Also, according to Cox in his contemporary work, Travels, when it came to recruiting old believers, Pugachev, quote, was artful enough to take advantage of their religious prejudices, which he openly professed to espouse and protect. When he traveled through Muslim communities, the rebel leader was also supportive of their religious beliefs, claiming to fully protect them as well. Because of this, Pugachev was met with enthusiasm everywhere he went. Did the people really believe that he was Peter III? Well, that's debatable. But really, it didn't really matter. Indeed, some of his closest associates, Zarubin, Shigayev, and Miaznikov, had been accomplices in the ruse and not dupes. Some went so far as to claim that it was Pugachev who was their puppet, something that Emelian claimed when interrogated. As Miaznikov claimed in his testimony, we accepted him as the deceased sovereign, Peter, Fyodorovich, so that he would restore our customs and destroy all the boyars, who think they are so clever in everything. We hoped that our undertaking would be supported and our power multiplied by the common folk who are oppressed and headed for ruin. He further went on to say that the government was trying to, quote, introduce a new kind of military state that we never agreed to accept. It does not matter to us whether he is sovereign or not. Out of mud we can make a prince. Even if he does not seize the Muscovite throne, we shall make the Yaik our own kingdom. News of Peter III's arrival in the area was spread throughout the Yaik. Hundreds of Cossacks flocked to him. On September 17, 1773, Pugachev sent out his first manifesto, written by Ivan Pochilatnin, as Emelian was illiterate. In it, it said, quote, I, the sovereign, Peter Fyodorovich, pardon you of all your sins and grant you the river from its source to its mouth, the earth and the grass, and a subsidy of money, lead, powder, and grain. All this grant I, the great sovereign and emperor, Peter Fyodorovich, that day, the rebellion began with a march on the Cossack capital of Yaitsk. Unfortunately for the rebels, Yaitsk was way too heavily fortified for an attempt to be made on it, so off to the next town, Miletsk, was surrendered without a fight. 
Pugachev issued an ultimatum to all the towns that anyone who resisted would be tortured and executed. But those that joined him, quote, I shall grant you eternal freedom, the rivers and seas, and all sorts of benefits and subsidies, food, powder, and lead, rank and honor, and liberty for centuries to come. Throughout September and early October, village after village came over to the rebel cause. Occasionally a fort would hold out, but usually not for long. Whenever resistance was met and overcome, the officers and town officials were hung. Fear was beginning to grip the countryside by the gentry. But it was only the beginning. The first fortress Pugachev took by force was Fort Tatishishev, led by Colonel Fyodor Ilagin and Brigadier Christian von Bulow. There were over 1,400 well-armed soldiers manning the fort, but that didn't stop the rebels. They tricked the garrison by lighting stacks of hay on fire by the walls on one side, and while the soldiers were busy putting out the flames, they were attacked from behind and captured. Ilagin and von Bulow were quickly executed. From here they set their sights on the main administrative town of Orenburg. Here we have the first similarity with the Razin and Bulavan rebellions, as Pugachev makes the decision to face off against a well-fortified town and not focusing on gaining followers by plunging straight into the heartland. But Emelian had it in his mind that all the bad that had befallen the Yai coast came from Orenburg, with all of their hated tax collectors and administrators. In his mind, it was time to settle the score with them. Now this was not going to be easy, so they decided to put Orenburg under a general siege. The city was poorly protected with only 3,000 irregular troops available, but their fortifications were stern, and they had prepared for an attack. With the Russian winter approaching, they dug in for a long battle. Pugachev's growing army surrounded the town. They set up headquarters in the nearby village of Berda, just a few miles north of Orenburg. While the siege continued, Pugachev sent men out to the countryside to gather new recruits. He ordered the villagers to stop working for their masters and offered a reward of a hundred rubles for the death of a landowner along with the destruction of his home. For every ten gentry killed, one thousand rubles and the rank of general was given. Priests were told under penalty of death that they were to conduct services using the old believer's methods, especially when it came to making the sign of the cross. If they used three fingers, as ordered by the changes made by Patriarch Nikon, they would be executed. Because of this, his rank swelled with schematics and all sorts of rabble. Miners, foundry workers, Cossacks, serfs, and all sorts of tribesmen, like the Bashkirs, Tatars, Kalmyks, and Kazakhs joined Pugachev's band. An unusual group that joined was exiled Polish officers who were banished to Siberia after the end of the war with Poland. Some disgruntled noblemen who had lost their position in their land also decided to join in. Because of the wide variety of people who decided to jump in with Pugachev, Emilian issued the following edict. Great and small, poor and rich, all will be esteemed as one class by the sovereign and merciful Tsar. He had to appeal to all because, as with all rebellions like this, there was a lot of dissension in the ranks. There were Muslims and Christians in the rebellion, many of whom hated each other. The most powerful group within the rebellion was the semi-nomadic Bashkirs. They were heavily persecuted ever since the fall of Kazan under Ivan the Terrible. Missionaries were sent to convert these Muslim people, sometimes forcing conversion by gunpoint. Their lands were slowly but surely being taken away as the Russian colonization was expanding into their territory. They revolted in 1735, but they were crushed after a six-year war. Over 30,000 tribesmen were tortured and executed in retaliation. 400 towns were destroyed and tens of thousands displaced. But they would not be put down as in 1755 they rose up yet again. While many new settlers were killed, in the end, the Bashkirs with their arrows and spears could not match up against the Russian army's guns and cannons. 
You would think that joining Pugachev's rebellion would be an easy choice for the Bashkirs, but you would be wrong. There was a deep-seated mistrust of anything Russian. They also despised the Yayik Cossacks, as they had helped crush their two rebellions. Also within the rank and file of the Bashkirs, there was dissension. The wealthy among them did not feel that another fight was in their best interests. Some, though, felt that despite all the differences, this would be their very last chance to get back the lives that were taken away from them. But of all the groups that were fed up most by their treatment by the government were the factory peasants. They were so mistreated and worked in such horrific conditions that they were the angriest at their plight in life. This was to be the proletariat that Lenin was to focus on when he pulled off the one successful revolution in Russia some 140 years later. The industrialization and subjugation of the workers expanded greatly during this time. As Paul Average puts it in his book, quote, The industrialization of the Urals, already begun on a small scale in the late 17th century, assumed major proportions under Peter the Great and his successors. Rich beds of copper and iron, as well as an abundance of woodlands for fuel and rivers for transportation, favored a rapid development of the area. Mines, furnaces, and smelting works, founded by the state or by resourceful merchants and gentry, such as the Dimidovs, the Stroganovs, the Verdichevs, and the Miaznikovs, sprang up in every corner, reaching a high water mark in the 1740s and 1750s, when the number of enterprises more than doubled. So that a hundred factories dotted the Urals by the time of Catherine's ascension in 1762. The workers here, for the most part, were serfs. Merchants were allowed by Peter the Great to buy whole villages of state serfs and transport them en masse to the Urals to work in whatever capacity they were needed. To add insult to injury, all free working men were converted into bonded workers tied to the factories by decree in 1736. The numbers of these workers rose from about 100,000 in the 1740s to double that by the time Pugachev started the rebellion. He had an eager and large force to draw upon. To put into perspective what their lives were like, a report from an army officer to the court of Catherine went like this. Just look at the factory workers, especially the ascribed peasants, who have been sacrificed completely to the factory owners. And those predators think about nothing but their own gain and greedily devour all the property of the peasants. As Dr. Average writes about the displaced state peasants, quote, it was a dismal existence, tatamount in their eyes to penal servitude, and they found adjusting to it difficult. Rather than better conditions, they wanted to rid themselves of the factories and return to the rural life, which for all its hardships seemed a lost paradise by comparison. They yearned to be restored to the state peasantry, which they considered their rightful status. But their petitions to the government were unavailing. These factories were notorious hotbeds of violent outbursts, especially the Avziano Petrovsk works, where a man named Klopusha had been arrested and punished and imprisoned for his part in leading some of the revolts. The governor of the time, Reinsdorp, offered Klopusha his freedom if he would go to the people and denounce Pugachev. Wanting out of the squalid conditions of the prison, he agreed. Then as soon as he made it to Pugachev's camp, he joined up with the rebel leader. Pugachev used Klopusha as a recruiter amongst the factory and mine workers in the area to much success. Returning to Berda, Klopusha bought with him not only 1,000 hardened men, but cannons, rifles, powder, and money. By the end of 1773, the rebel army numbered, numbered between 10 and 15,000. But with his growing number came discipline issues. Masterfully, Pugachev began to band the men into regiments of like kind. He assigned Andrei Ovchininkov to the Yayik Cossacks, 
Klopusha, the factory workers, Kinzia Arslanov, the Bashkirs, and so on. By now, Pugachev was near the height of his power, and he began to play the part of Peter III in earnest. He created his own palace in the finest house in Berta, where he held court. There, he was referred to as Your Excellency, or Batushka, also known as Dear Father. When Catherine was apprised of the situation, she was unworried, but felt that the governor at Orenburg can handle the situation. It was, of course, just another Cossack uprising in a faraway place. Still, just to be sure, they sent troops to squash the rebellion, led by Major General Vasily Carr. Four other regiments were dispatched from Siberia, Kazan, the Volga, and Simbirsk, quickly thereafter. Carr made it to Pugachev's camp first, and was stunned to see the size of it. He was quickly encircled and forced to retreat to Kazan, because, as he put it, quote, the rogues swept in like the wind from the steppe, and their artillery did much damage. They also did not shoot the way one might expect of peasants. Pugachev then wheeled around and crushed the army from Simbirsk, led by Colonel Chernyeshev. He had many of the officers and the colonel executed, along with one of their wives. While this was going on, Brigadier Korf, with his men from Kazan, slipped into Orenburg with his 2,500 men and 22 cannons to lend support to the beleaguered city. Catherine's concern was now growing rapidly. She appointed the veteran of the Seven Years' War, General Alexander Bibikov, in December 1773, to take command of the counterinsurgency army, which quickly headed to Kazan. He was born of a military family and was a highly decorated soldier. Catherine sent out a manifesto denouncing Pugachev as a pretender. As she put it, It would be superfluous here to prove the absurdity of such an imposture, which cannot even put on a shadowy probability in the eyes of sensible people. Yaitsk had fallen, and Ufa and Orenburg were in trouble, were Cherlyabinsk under siege. The Pugachev army, now numbered 30,000, was growing every day. It was January 1774, and Pugachev was to make a major error in judgment when he married a local Cossack girl. You may wonder, how is this an error in judgment? Well, the answer is in the character Emelian was portraying, Peter III. What emperor would ever marry an ordinary Cossack? Oh, and yeah, we may not like her, but aren't you still married to that woman up in St. Petersburg, Catherine? And to those in his inner circle, how about your other wife and kids in the Don? While this was planting seeds of discontent within his organization, it didn't stop the movement from growing and heading out to scour the countryside for victims. With the new recruits came new leaders with the most notable being Ivan Beloborodov. He bought with him a force of men from the Demidov foundry in Ekaterinburg. Ivan looted the facility, taking cash, weapons, and ammunition. From there, he headed out to a number of other factories, telling them that the great sovereign was leading them to freedom. Throughout Ekaterinburg, factories were falling into rebel hands, and weapons were being manufactured at a furious pace. With the Bashkirs, a charismatic leader stood out named Yulia Aznalin, the son of a prominent elder and an outstanding soldier in the Seven Years' War. At first, Aznalin was part of the troops led by Governor Reinsdorp to stop the insurrection, but instead he switched sides after being captured. Not only was he a good leader, he was, like Beloborodov, a great recruiter. Now, let's review where we are with the rebels. The cities of Ufa and Orenburg were under siege, Yaitsk was under rebel control, and Kungar and Ekaterinburg were in trouble. When General Bibikov arrived in Kazan in late December 1773, he posted a 10,000 ruble reward for Pugachev's capture. From there, he began to size up the forces he was going to face. Bibikov was a wise general, and he knew why the people were in revolt. He knew that this was a class struggle between the haves and the have-nots. As he told the nobles in Kazan, 
quote, this is a result and revolt of the poor against the rich, of the slaves against their masters. Another thing that Bibikov knew was that Pugachev himself was not an issue. Quote, Pugachev is not important. What is important is the general indignation. As the famous Russian poet Gavril Derjavan, who was a re- lieutenant under Bibikov, wrote, quote, One must determine whether, in the event we kill him, there will not appear a new and even more dastardly swine calling himself the Tsar. Is he the only one who calls himself by that name, or are there many who do so? Do the people look upon him as the real deceased sovereign, or do they know that he is in fact Pogachev, though their coarse instincts for insurrection and robbery do not allow them to reject him? Catherine herself understood the reasons for the revolt, which was known as Pugachev Shachina. But she also realized that her greatest supporters were the gentry, who were threatened by Pugachev and his men. Because of that, she upped the reward for his capture, had his house on the Don burned, and his family sent to Kazan, where Bibikov tried to use them to discredit the rebel leader. None of this works. So, here is where we pause. So join me next time as we complete the retelling of the story of the Pugachev Rebellion. Well, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Reminder, if you can go over to my blog site at www.russianrulershistory.com, you can post some quotes and notes over there if you'd like, or you can sign up for updates or maybe make a donation, big or small, to keep the podcast going. And if you have a moment, please rate the podcast on iTunes to help boost its ranking and get more listeners. And join us on Facebook, where we've just been having some fantastic uh, conversations there and a lot of great ideas. I want to thank those listeners for the ideas for future podcasts. So many of them are just so incredible. I just really appreciate it. So there you can ask a question, leave a message, or make a suggestion. So now, as always, das vidanya i